Again, as you find your way back to your seat there and grab your Bible, let's open the Bibles up to Psalm 83 as we continue on through the Psalms tonight. And uh, let's pray and ask for God to pour out his spirit and just really uh, speak to us, not through his word. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the Psalms. Again, what a beautiful expression of your word, God. Every book is beautiful in its own way. Every book has a meaning and a purpose to express your heart and to grow us as your children. And Lord, Psalm, Psalms is a book of praise. Lord, it's a book that teaches, teaches us how to worship and how to draw near to you, Lord. And it's not just singing, although these are songs. It's, it's Lord, the attitude of the heart. It's thankfulness. It's giving you glory. And I pray you continue to work in us through the teaching of your word, uh, hearts of praise. Teach us to be worshipers. Make us a church of worship. Yes, in song, uh, more so than we are now. But Lord, really a church of worship in heart with you, Lord, in your word. And so I pray you teach us now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever wonder why Israel is so singled out and hated? If you look around the world and you look at all the nations of the world, you'll see one nation that gets singled out on a regular basis for vitriol and hatred, and that is the nation of Israel. Now, a lot of nations will take a temporary hit. America gets its lumps, and other people, you know, say things about different nations. Israel is almost always in the news being whacked by someone for some reason, and most of the reasons I've noticed over the years are completely illogical. They make no sense whatsoever. It's been joked that you could throw a snowball in Israel into a car window and it would make the national news. Um, anything that goes wrong in Israel is a main event. Why is Israel so watched? Because God has his eyes on the nation of Israel and God has covenant promises to the people of Israel. Note that and let it sink deep into your heart. There is a push today, even among the church, sadly and shamefully, that would try to say that God is through with the nation of Israel and no longer has a portion with Israel and no longer is gonna keep his promises to the nation of Israel. Nothing could be farther from the truth. And again, just the very fact that everyone hates them should make a statement because Satan is the one behind that. Uh, it's been this way for thousands of years because Satan knows that God has promises to the nation of Israel. And because of that, he hates Israel and he moves in people's hearts to hate Israel and hate the Jews. And it's amazing to watch it happen. And even again, sadly, some within the church can't recognize the spiritual warfare. Now again, you look at the facts, the facts alone show us that God's hand is on the nation of Israel and he's going to keep his promises. God said, in the last days, I will bring you back in the land. Well, the nation of Israel is the only nation that has ever been disbanded for more than 300 years and has come back together as a nation. There is no other nation in history that's ever done that. The longest any nation ever made it was right around 300 years. Israel made it almost 2,000 years and came back together. Why? Because God promised it. Because God made a covenant with Abraham and his people and God keeps his promises. Now, many people don't keep their promises today, but God does. And so again, we see Satan hating that. He turns people against the nation of Israel. As I said, sadly, even influences some of the church to say that God is through the nation of Israel. Now you would think in 1948, when they became a nation again and broke all records of anyone ever being restored in that way, and then to see how the wars that have been fought against them, all these nations coming against them in multiple wars, overwhelmed with power, overwhelmed with numbers, Israel has not only won every single one of them, they've gained more territory and more power every time. Why is that? Why is Israel such a blessed nation? Why do they have more um, you know, scholars, if you will, and, and achievements coming out of Israel? It's amazing. Israel is the highest producing, uh, I think the, either the highest or the second or third highest fruit producing nation in the world. They're the size of New Jersey. Um, they have one of the largest gas reserves, now a, a huge oil reserve. We were talking about it tonight before we even got into this, how God blesses that nation. The very first smartphone, this is going to shock some of you guys, the very first smartphone we had was in 2007. Doesn't that seem like it was like a thousand years ago? Seems like the, the first, you know, smartphone was back when, when dinosaurs probably stepped on one. 2007. You know who invented it? Israel. So, oh, Apple, no, it wasn't Apple. It was Israel. This was a, a company out of Israel, their technology. Apple purchased the technology. And maybe what we have today is the Apple phone, the iPhone, all these others. 
Again, I could go down a list over and over and over how God has blessed. You look at World War II and the Jews being attempted to be exterminated. Isn't it interesting that God used a Jew to create the atom bomb? Again, I could go on forever about the hand of God on the Jewish people um, and to see what God has done through them. But it just accentuates as we get into Psalm 83, I wanted to make that point because he's going to be talking about the nations that, that even back in his day that wanted to destroy the nation of Israel because it's a spiritual battle. And we still have them today. When I read Psalm 83, this could literally be in the headlines today. I was looking at the news in the last two weeks and the things we're going to read about are exactly what's being said about the nation of Israel by the surrounding nations right now in our day and age. Nothing has changed because the same spirit Spirit is still working against the nation of Israel and fighting against God, which is all the more reason we should be standing with the nation of Israel. And you say, well, but Mark, they're not believers and they don't love God. That's true. But we know they're future believers. There's a huge portion of the Jewish people today who will come to Christ in the last days, the Bible tells us. And even if they don't become believers, we're to love everyone, right? So we should love them anyway, but they're future family. Remember, God's outside of time. He sees everything from beginning to the end. Can you imagine if you knew, um, you know, if you could, if you knew the kids you were going to have, or you knew the people you're going to know, or whatever the case might be, and you went back to your young years and this kind of thing, you would make sure you did everything the same so that those people would still be there because you knew in advance they were going to be there and you couldn't imagine not having them in your life and suddenly them not existing, if you will, to, kind of a time traveler type thing um, to think about. God sees it all. Everything's been played out before him. He knows every single Jew that's going to give their life to Christ. Now, they're not going to be saved by very many numbers right now. This is why I don't think that really an excessive amount of evangelism really needs to be poured into the nation of Israel. Don't get me wrong. They need to hear the gospel. They need to be reached out to like anyone else. But God tells us in Romans that he has temporarily blinded their eyes. It's a God thing. God says, because you rejected your Messiah... I'm going to close your eyes. So no matter how much of the gospel you hear, you're not going to believe it. That's why there are so few numbers of Jews that get saved. And if you're here tonight and you're Jewish and you know the Lord, you're really one of the remnant, truly, because God has blinded the eyes of the nation. So it's not that we don't reach out to the Jewish people. It's not that we don't love them. It's not that we don't pray for them, but God has a supernatural blindfold over their eyes. And until God lifts that, all of our evangelistic efforts in the world aren't going to make a huge difference. Although we still should be reaching out because he has his kids there. And they are coming to Christ. And since God is so consistent to work with that whole tithe mindset, I wouldn't be surprised if about a tenth of the Jews are the ones now that he's, that he's bringing to Christ during this time of national blindness. But he's going to lift that blindness and you're going to see an influx of the Jewish people coming into the kingdom. In the meantime, you're going to see Satan doing everything he can to destroy the nation of Israel. And it hasn't changed over thousands of years as we're going to see right now in Psalm 83. Let's jump into it. A song, a Psalm of Asaph. He says, do not keep silent, O God, do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God, for behold, your enemies make a tumult. Now, I love how he makes this. Again, it's them that's being attacked, but he, he refers to them as God's enemies. And that's true, but isn't that a great way to look at it? It's like, hey, God, they're attacking you. You know, one of the issues we have now, you look at what's happening with, with our fellowship and, and anytime we come to a situation where we need to add parking or we need to put lights in or we need to do something else, you know, I don't, I don't say, okay, God, you've got a problem. But in the back of my mind, I realize, Lord, this is your issue. It's not mine. And I've learned over the years to relax. If issues come up because of something in the church, as long as I'm walking with God, as long as we're doing what we're supposed to do as a church and church leadership to the best of our ability, it's not really our concern. It's God's concern. So how are you going to deal with that? I don't have to worry about that. God's going to deal with that. And see, the same thing translates into your homes, mom and, moms and dads. Uh, that is, if you have an issue in your home and you're doing what you're supposed to do, mom, or you're doing what you're supposed to do, dad, or you're doing husband or wife, whatever role you're looking at where something's going on in your life, do what you're supposed to do. And it's God's situation he's got to deal with. And he will. He'll be faithful to do that. And so he says, it's your enemies, oh God. They're the ones that are doing this. Your enemies make a tumult. And those who hate you, you have lifted up their head. Or rather, those that hate you, rather. Let me read that again. And those who hate you have lifted up their heads. He's saying your enemies are showing themselves. They've taken crafty counsel against your people. It is amazing to see how crafty oftentimes the counsel is against the nation of Israel. But it always amazes me to see how crafty the nation of Israel is with everyone else. I remember uh, during one of our recent administrations, 
um, they were leaking information about Israel in the news. I remember this was years back and it drove me crazy because the administration that was in power at that time was purposefully leaking information to harm the nation of Israel. And again, it's that same spirit of Antichrist, that same kind of thing that was happening. And I'd watch it happen and then I'd watch the wisdom of God. And it was so amazing to watch the wisdom of God and, and just to see the way they handled it and the way they dealt diplomatically. God, even though the enemy deals craftily with God's people, God gives wisdom that can silence the craftiness of the enemy. He says, they've taken crafty counsel against your people. They've consulted together against your sheltered ones. Now look at this. Here's the modern headlines. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. You ever heard that anytime recently? It, that's Iran every day. Destroy the nation of Israel, cut off the nation of Israel. Uh, other people, Turkey, destroy the, destroy the nation of Israel. Gaza Strip, their enemies around them. Destroy the nation of Israel. You hear it all the, you know, everywhere because it's the same spirit today. He says, do this, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. Sorry, that's not gonna happen. But God says the name of Israel will last forever. They're not gonna be wiped out. Now that they're back in the land, they will never be defeated and removed from the land again. Now they'll be attacked. They may uh, you know, have certain defeats and certain things, but God's word is clear. He said, when I bring them back in the land in the last days, they will not be removed again. They're there to stay. And they're gonna be there until the Lord comes back and then he's gonna establish his thousand year reign. He's gonna give them the territory that he promised to them and they're gonna fully occupy everything. I say occupy, I hate to even use that word. They're gonna fully take over everything God has given them. Now here's what's wild about this. We see today they have this small little portion of land, again, the size of New Jersey, and everybody has a fit about how big it is. So they've got too much land, right? What, they call one area the West Bank, and this area down here, they call them occupiers. Guys, the Arab peoples around them and the other people around them have, have millions and millions and millions of acres and plenty of territory. Israel's got this little tiny blip in the middle of it, and they're saying Israel has too much land. We wanna take their land from them. God said he has given to Israel, get this, from the land of Egypt, the Nile, all the way over to, to, the, uh, to Babylon. That's basically Iran and Iraq today. So God says the land that I've given to them is from modern day Iraq and Iran all the way down to Egypt. That's what is really theirs. The world's letting them have this tiny little sliver. And again, it's because of their disobedience. Don't get me wrong. God said, if you were obedient to me, I'd give you all of it. But they're being disobedient. So that's about, they have probably about a 10th of the land God has promised. That kind of tithe idea again. Again, I don't know, but it'd be a fun little study to do because it seems to work in that kind of mindset. But the reality is when everybody's complaining about the nation of Israel having too much land, they don't have near what they're going to have. And God's going to give them the land and it's his land to give, so he's able to do that. But notice it says, verse five, for they've consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against, note this, you. I have that circled. They don't conform a confederacy against Israel, although, although they do. What the psalmist is recognizing, what Asaph is recognizing is, God, this is you they're fighting against. This isn't us. It's you. And by the way, believer, keep that in mind. When you're opposed for your faith, it's not you they're fighting against. It's the Lord they're fighting against. If people are upset with you because you stand on the word of God, let me ask you this question. Did you write the word of God? Did you come up with this? Is this your idea and you decided to propagate it? You're just a messenger. It's not you that they hate. It's God that they hate. And the psalmist is saying, Lord, you're the one they hate. Their confederacy is against you. Notice who it is, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites. Again, it's gonna be the surrounding nations and the Arab nations, which is this ancient between you know Ishmael and Isaac that's been going for thousands of years. He says, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebal, Ammon and Amalek, that's the Jordan region um, and, and um, down below Jordan. Ph uh, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, that's the, the Lebanon region. Assyria, that's modern day Syria, also has joined with them and they've helped the children of Lot, the children of Lot, again, Moab and Ammon, uh, in essence, if you will. So he already mentions them, but the surrounding countries around them, still today, they oppose them. Now, Egypt has peace with them on paper. Jordan has peace with them on paper. And God has kept it that way because God has some you know, promises to those nations. Uh, and mostly the promise to Israel, he's gonna use them uh, in Israel's uh, future. But the reality is they're hated because the enemy stirs them to be hated. And they're not gonna be wiped out. 
no matter how many conspiracies, no matter how much they say they're going to attack them uh, and, and do them in. And again, he ends this little portion by saying, Selah, also meditate on that. They've, everybody's turned against Israel, so he's crying out saying, God, deal with our enemies. Frustrate our enemies. Don't let them have victory. And they're not going to. He says, deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, at Jabin, at the brook Kishon. These are all famous battles where Israel defeated their enemies. Those who perished at Endor, who became a refuse on the earth, make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb. Yes, all the princes like Zeba and Zalmunna. Now getting into, again, uh, Gideon and some of his battle that he defeated the enemies. Who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for possession. Notice God's very possessive of his land. They're saying, let us take this land for ourselves because this is my land that you're trying to take. I've given it to the Jews, but it belongs to me ultimately. He's, he's the landlord and literally the land Lord, if you will. He says, oh my God, make them like a whirling dust. You ever seen the dust from the wind, those dirt devils that it stirs up? Make them like a whirling dust. Just blow them away, in other words, like the chaff before the wind. As the fire burns the woods and as the flame sets the mountains on fire. Again, this whole picture of kind of this raging fire uh, destroying the mountains, even as God would destroy Israel's enemies. So pursue them with your tempest, frighten them with your storm. Now, I find this interesting. I think back in, uh, remember uh, in the Iraqi uh, situation, Saddam Hussein attacking the nation of Israel. And whenever I see someone attack Israel, it's only a matter of time until God takes them down. Whenever that happens, it's going to be, okay, God, how are you going to do it? How long is this going to last? I've watched it, and I haven't lived that long, um, you know, comparatively, but when you, history-wise. But for the time I've been alive, everybody that moves against Israel, God brings them down. I'll never forget watching that. I remember it broke out. I lived in Santa Fe at the time when, that, when Saddam Hussein began to attack the nation of Israel. And I said it right then. I, everybody around were talking about it. I said, hey, it's only a matter of time. Saddam's going down. This is going to be stopped. It's going to be wiped out. This isn't going to last long. God's going to deal with it. It really went on a little bit longer than I thought it would. It went on for 100, um, 100 days. And again, remember what they called it. They called it desert storm. Notice what he says. Pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. <laughs> isn't that interesting? I'm not saying it's specifically speaking of desert storm at that time, but that's the mindset. Lord, just deal with them. You know, by the way, it's interesting. When you go back and look at some of the, if you know what you're looking for, it's exciting to watch these battles with Israel. If you don't know what you're looking for, it'll, it'll go right past you. But I'm always looking for God to do these miracles and these special things when I see something relating to the nation of Israel because of all the promises that he has for them. Saddam Hussein shot 39 Scud missiles into the nation of Israel, and they landed, most of them, in Tel Aviv and in major populated areas. Not one person was killed by being hit with a Scud missile. Think about that. Now, a couple died. There were a couple that did die, but not because a Scud missile hit them. They were older and they had heart attacks from fear. So there were some recorded heart attacks from fear because of the Scud missiles, but not a single person was killed by the Scud missile. And even when this happened, even the rabbi, I remember seeing one rabbi going, God is chastising our nation. We need to repent. And I said, oh, if you only knew. See, here's what's really interesting about this. You know, God loves them. God has begun the chastisement of the nation of Israel. He's going to continue to chastise them. They're going to get backed into a corner. It's going to get harder and harder on them, worse and worse on them because they won't repent. Finally, they're going to be cornered by all the nations. We know the next major battle is going to be Russia and Iran moving in to attack them. They're going to feel, oh no, we're going to be wiped out and God's going to intervene supernaturally and rescue them. That's going to be, I believe, a major catalyst for many of them coming to Christ. Might even be when God pours out his spirit. But here's what's really interesting to me to watch how God chastises. Because the Bible says that God starts out with, you know, with, like with your own kids. There's one spank, there's two spanks, there's three spanks. And again, usually you kind of have a capper on that. I know you tend to set a cap on that. We're not going to go beyond that. Um, but then, you know, the mom with the shoe and you're running down the hall, it may go beyond that every once in a while. Um, that's just kind of life. But either way, 39 Scud missiles. When you were being disciplined at the temple or at the tabernacle in the days of Jesus, they would strap you down and hit you with how many lashes? 39. 39 lashes. And that was to say, you should be ashamed, you're disobedient to God, and you need to repent. God gave the nation of Israel 39 lashes during desert storm. And then God said, okay, that's enough. 
they stopped at that. They, they wouldn't give 40. 40 was prescribed, a, a normal beating. The Romans would give 40. The Jews would only give 39. And the Jews didn't beat you the way the Romans did. They wouldn't strip you and use the flogging and, and almost kill you. It was a situation where you were not hit, struck as hard. It was more of a spanking and certainly more of a, a humility and a shaming than anything else. But they would only do 39. They stopped before 40 because they said 40 was too much. 40 would humiliate. Only 39. You've gone too far with 40. And then God gives them 39 lashes. It's interesting, I can't help but share a couple of these, and then we'll get right back into it. If you remember, um, ah, I've forgotten his name right now, but he was the very first Muslim Congress member that we had, uh, Matt Ellison. Matt Ellison in Minnesota. Um, I don't know if you remember, um, a few years back, a bridge that broke free in Minnesota and crashed into the water. Anybody remember that? That day, Matt Ellison is the first Muslim Congress member, uh, had been elected. I don't know if he's elected that day, but that day he was making a speech and he said, I'm going to Israel and I'm gonna be pushing to fight against Israel to go back to the 1967 border um, uh, to give them less land and, um, and to make a stand for the Palestinians and all this kind of stuff, blah, 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 whatever. Well, it's interesting. On that day, he made that announcement. And remember, God said, if you fight against my people, you're fighting against me. On that day that he made that announcement, it was in his district. Again, his big thing was the West Bank. We're gonna go back and bring them out of the West Bank and push them back to the 67 borders. On that day in his district, his district is where that bridge collapsed. And you know where the bridge broke free from? The West Bank. They announced it on the news. The West Bank of the bridge collapsed. And guess when the bridge was built? 1967. Now, if you don't know what you're looking for, you go, oh, a bridge collapsed in Minnesota. But if you know the word of God and you know his promises to the nation of Israel and you know what to look for, you're gonna go, oh, on a regular basis. And that's why I try my best to teach you guys prophecy and the word of God so you can go with me, oh, and we can all do it together. Ready? Together. Oh. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Let's not do that. But again, it says, your, verse uh, 15, so pursue them with your tempest, frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that, look at the reason he says to fill their face with shame. There's a major lesson in this, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Really? Two things to note. God wants his enemies to repent and be saved. God wants the enemies of Israel to repent and be saved. And although the psalmist is calling out saying, God judge them, God judge them, but you know what? Do this so they'll repent and be saved. That's the true heart of a prophet. That's the true heart of a child of God. Yes, God, we want you to defend us, but hey, those that are attacking us, Lord, would you save them? Would you open their eyes? But also it's the technique that God uses. This is something that in our culture today, they say should never be done. God does it all the time. And that is God uses shame to bring people to repentance. That's one of God's chastising tools, shame. You know, you should never shame anyone. I beg to differ. God shamed people all the time, and I think he still does it today. Shame can be healthy if it's done with the right heart and the right way. Now, if it's just somebody, you know, tearing someone down and, and trying to destroy them, it's wrong. But God, he says here, fill their faces with shame that, hopefully that the shame will have its purpose, that they can seek your name. Let them be broken. Let the shame be so humiliating, they'll cry out to God. He goes right back to, let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish. Again, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. It's interesting, the, the terminology here, because they're saying in this Psalm, as we finish 83, they're saying, destroy Israel, wipe out Israel, wipe out Israel, because Allah is greater than all gods. And in this Psalm, he says, Lord, make them ashamed of their defeat. So, they'll know, so they will know that you are higher than all gods. Powerful, very appropriate for today. Again, this, you're reading the news headlines right here out of your Bible. And that's how the Bible always is. It is alive and breathing. It is just as applicable today as it ever was and it ever will be. So there's Psalm 83. Psalm 84 now. To the chief musician on an instrument of Gath, a song of the sons of Korah. Um, this is the, just a blessing of being around God's, God's house, if you will. Uh, even what being here tonight. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. Again, the courts of the Lord. Remember, you have the temple and around it, you have what they call the courts. The court of the men, 
uh, the court of the women, and then the court of the Gentiles. And that was the way they viewed it. Gentiles were the lowest on the rung. Next were women, and after women came the men who were Jewish, or followers of, of, of Yahweh, if you will. And so, um, again, he says, my heart longs for your courts. I want to be in the courts of the Lord. I want to be in the place of worship. I want to be where God's spirit is moving. And see, that's our cry tonight. We want to be where God's spirit is moving. He says, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Ever been there? Hopefully we are tonight, right? Lord, we need you, Lord. We want you. He says, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, um, my King and my God. He said, look, even the birds want to be close to your courts. They want to build their nests and be your glorious. You know, I've got these cute little birds. Um, I forget what kind they are, but they're there every year right outside of my office window. Cute little red, they're little tiny guys, gray, little red chest and little red beak. Um, but not a, not a cardinal, but they're smaller, but they're kind of, but not a sparrow. I, I, it'll hit me maybe in a minute. But they get on my windowsill and they just dance back and forth all the time. And they're so cute. And I sometimes sit there and watch them and I'll talk to them because it's reflective glass. They can't see me. And I'll tell them, you're so cute. You're so cute. Look at you. And there's a little wife will land and they're both hopping back and forth and whatever. And I'm like, you know, I like it here too. We all like it here. Because God's spirit's here. And he said, even the birds want to be where God is. I mean, think about it. Even the animals recognize the glory of the Lord. They want to be where the Lord is. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you, Selah. Meditate on that. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. I love this. Whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Is your heart set on pilgrimage tonight? What do I mean by that? What's pilgrimage? I don't belong here. This is temporary. I'm just passing through. This is not my home. I've got, I'm just, I put down a tent called a house and I live in a tent called a body, but this is not my home. The problem that we have oftentimes as believers is we try to make this too much our home. And I understand wanting to go home and I'll be home for Christmas and all the home feeling. I get all that. God is gracious to give us that. But this is not our home. We're here as messengers on a temporary mission from God, and then we all go to the true home later. We can't associate real well yet because we don't know what that's like, but that's what the reality is, the Bible tells us. And what he's saying is, blessed is the person who sets their heart on it. I, my heart is set, he's saying, the psalmist. It's set on just me being temporary and knowing that I'm going home at some point. We need to have our heart set there because if our heart is set on that, we can handle all the madness down here. You ever, you know, watch the news and watch what's happening in our world and just, you want to yank your hair out or someone else's hair? If your heart is set on pilgrimage, it calms down. I look at that now and I go, you know what, Lord, have mercy on us. And, and yes, we should take action. Yes, we should speak up. Yes, we should pray. Yes, we should do all this. But Lord, this is a temporary stop. I don't belong here. I'm not going to be here much longer. And I, my heart is set on just pilgrimage. I'm not going to set my heart on this world. I'm not going to set my heart on the affections of this world. I'm going to be wise in this world with what you give me, but my heart is going to be set on heaven. And he says, blessed is the person who sets their heart on pilgrimage. Notice this, as they pass through the valley of Baca. Did you know you're passing through the valley of Baca? Baca means weeping. How many of you can associate that this world is a valley of weeping? This is a valley of weeping. Doesn't mean we don't have fun. I'm having fun tonight. Doesn't mean we don't have joy. I've got joy tonight. But the reality is we're passing through a valley of weeping. We have joy because God gives us joy. We have great times because God allows that by his mercy. But there's a lot of weeping in this world. There's death, there's sorrow, there's, there's pain, there's hurt, there's problems. There's life collapsing around us. It's the valley of Baca, but take heart. You're a pilgrim. You don't belong in the valley of Baca. You're not gonna be in the valley of Baca much longer. You're gonna go to the kingdom of heaven. And that's going to be your place forever. And so that's where our hope is. And that's where the psalmist says, hey, that's where my hope is. But we pass through the valley of weeping. They make it a spring. That is believers. Rather than weeping, you know, we make it a spring. God gives us his spirit. He gives us the water of life. And we make the best of it. The rain also covers it with pools. So we have refreshment from heaven in this valley of weeping. They go from strength to strength. I love that. God has promised that if we walk with him, we will go from strength to strength. Again, we have hard times, we have difficult times, but we go from strength to strength. And I can tell you, I'm much stronger now than I was 30 years ago when this journey began. We go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Well, that's a sober reminder, isn't it? Valley of weeping, 
Temporary pilgrimage, called to do what we're supposed to do while we're here, growing from strength to strength, and then one day we're gonna stand before Jesus and we're gonna give account. Now again, we're gonna get rewards. He's not gonna judge us based on our sin, but it's still sobering to me to think that I'm gonna stand before the Lord and give account. You know, as a pastor, this came up again this week. There's so many weird teachings that float around from time to time. I'm not gonna get in, in, into any of that tonight. I'm already derailing myself enough to get through. I wanna get through six Psalms. But there's so much stuff. The Bible says, there's, be careful of the winds of doctrine that blow through. There's always winds of doctrine. How do we make sure that we stay constant and steady? We stay in the word. We don't veer outside of the word. And these winds of doctrine that are out there, all of them will always go outside of the word to either man's theories or other resources or whatever the case might be. And the accusation is often for those of us who stick with the word, well, you're just limiting God because you're whatever. I'm gonna stand before God one day and so are you. And I'd much rather stand before God and say, I just believed what you gave me and what you validated as your word. You're God Almighty, you're able to write a book, you're able to pick which books are in that book and you're able to preserve it, which now we have proven from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have the same thing they did hundreds of years even before Christ. So it's actually scientifically provable now, although I didn't need that and you didn't need it either. But the reality is I can stand before the Lord. I'd rather stand before the Lord and him say, Mark, you know, there was more I was gonna show you, but you just stayed within the confounds of the Bible. I'll say, wow, I'd rather be there than him say, Mark, what in the world were you doing? Well, well, these guys, they sounded really convincing. These guys, I'm God. I wrote the book. Why are you looking outside to other books? Why are you looking to other sources? Why are you introducing new teachings in the last day when I said to beware of that? We're gonna stand before him. And I wanna make sure I can say, you know what? If he says, Mark, you stuck with my word and you only believed what was in it, I'm gonna say guilty as charged. Whatever you choose to do to me now, I'm, I'm at your mercy. But I don't wanna stand there and him say, what in the world were you doing? Uh, you, you knew better than that. And so um, again, the psalmist here, you know, bragging on God, saying we're gonna appear before God. He says, oh Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Again, meditate on that. Oh God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day, one day, he's saying, in your courts is better than a thousand. I mean, anywhere else basically is what he's saying. One day close to God is better than a thousand days anywhere else. And yet where do I oftentimes find myself looking for that Filling, other places. This is where the filling comes from. This is where the F-I-L-L-I-N-G, not F-E-E. F-I-L-L-I-N-G. It comes from right here, being in the courts of God. Now, of course, in your home, and I'm not, anywhere you are with the Lord, it's gonna happen. My point is, he's making the point, I don't wanna try to find it in the world. It's not gonna satisfy, you know? Every day from now on at Disney, he's not gonna do it, you know? It's, it's the word of God. This is where our hope is. He says, one day is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. You give the palace of wickedness. I don't want to be there. I'd rather just watch the doors. I'd rather be a greeter at Calvary Knoxville than to have some high position in something that's wicked because this is where the blessing of the Lord is. This is where the reward of the Lord is. The beauty of the Lord, the glory of the Lord is where God's people come together and meet and just following him. I love that. He says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. If there's something that you think you should have and you're walking uprightly with God, he will not withhold it. Now, I'm not getting into the prosperity message and you can name it and claim it and be real. I'm not, that's, we're not going there. Y'all know better. What I'm saying is, if it's good for you and you're walking with God, God will bless you with it. You're not gonna miss out. He'll give you what he wants you to have and it'll be good things for you. So there's reward in walking with God. I've seen this so much in my life. So many things that God has done for me that I never thought I would ever see God do or ever have, uh, you know, just to him to do, just the blessings of the Lord. And he says, just, he just reminds me, there's no good thing. There's no good thing, Mark, I'm gonna withhold from you. If you just walk with me, you're gonna see. And this is just the beginning. Guys, this is, we're outside the foyer of eternity. Okay, we're waiting to get in. We're just pilgrims. Wait till we get in. We hadn't seen anything yet. This is gonna be going forever and ever with God's grace and God's glory. He says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Oh, Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. We need to trust him. Just trust him. 
He's got our best interests at heart. And so the psalmist ends with just praise of the Lord and lifting up the Lord's name uh, and glorifying God. So Psalm 84. Psalm 85 is a psalm of restoration. And again, this is a great psalm because, um, again, seeing the fact that, you know, it's one thing to repent. It's another thing to be restored. And the psalmist here is going to be writing about the fact, hey, we've, you know, Korah is going to write it. The sons of Korah is going to say, look, we've repented, but now we need to be restored. Look what he says. Lord, well, let me read to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you've been favorable to your land. You've brought back the captivity of Jacob. You've forgiven the iniquity of your people. So notice, we've been forgiven. That's happened. You've covered all of our sin. Say lot. Notice he didn't say you've taken our sin away. Why? Because sins couldn't be taken away until Jesus came on the cross. They could just be covered. That's where the whole word of atonement, it's a covering. The animals were temporary coverings of sin that got accepted, but it wasn't totally taken away until the blood of Jesus washed them away. But he says, you've covered our sins. Meditate on that. That's great. You've taken away all your wrath. You've turned from the fierceness of your anger. So you judged us. You've brought us back. We have repented. But Lord, we're still not where we used to be. You ever feel that way? Maybe you veered off in sin for a while and suddenly you're back. And here you are tonight going, yeah, that was me. I veered off in sin and I lost that sweet relationship that I used to have with the Lord. It's not the same. But I know he's forgiven me because he said, if I repent and ask forgiveness, he will. So I know I'm forgiven. I have that assurance in my heart and I also have the assurance of his word. But Lord, it just doesn't seem the same. Then this psalm is for you. The very next line, because that's where they were. And notice what he says in verse four. Restore us, O God of our salvation. Lord, I've repented. I know I'm forgiven. Restore me. I want it to be the way it used to be, Lord. I want to sense your presence and your power. I want to see you moving in my life, answering prayers, showing me new and exciting things. I know I'm saved, but Lord, I want to be back in a good relationship again. Restore us, O oh Lord. Cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Again, you ever feel that way? Lord, how long am I going to be in this place? Will you not revive us again? Again, we always pray, Lord, send revival, revive us. Will you not do it, Lord? And here's why, that your people may rejoice in you. Re revive me, Lord, so I can rejoice in you. That's, that's what I want to do is rejoice in you. What a great way to pray. Even to just revive me for revival's sake, Lord, revive me so I can rejoice in you because I'm not, I'm not feeling it. Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. So I've made my request. I'm going to listen. For he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. He's like, you know, oftentimes you see this pattern with Israel and we do the same thing. They repent and then God blesses them and revives them and restores them. And then they go back to their sin. They go back to folly. He's saying, Lord, restore us. We've repented, revive us, but don't let us go back to our folly. Because here's the, our nature. When things get good again, we get lazy spiritually. So things are going good, I don't need to cry as much. When things are bad, it's like, oh God, you gotta help me. My whole life's falling apart. Everything's gone. There's no hope of anything. And we cry out to God, like, great, now I'll revive you. We get revived. It's like, well, things are pretty good now. And so um, I can kind of just hang out and relax and not seek God as much. And we go right back to the old things we used to do that got us in trouble. He says, Lord, don't let us return to our folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Oh, I love this imagery too. Notice this, mercy and truth have met together. <laughs> righteousness and peace have kissed. Again, this beautiful bringing together of mercy, truth, righteousness, and peace in this intimate picture. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and he shall make his footsteps our pathway. What a great prayer. When you're praying the psalm, Lord, Make your footsteps my pathway. I want to follow your footsteps. I want to go where you go. Again, we, we, you've heard the analogies before. You've probably seen it as a kid. Somebody shoe prints. I remember the analogy of, of the little boy following his dad. His dad, true story, going out and walking in the snow one night. I had to go do something. And he's walking in the snow and walking in the snow. And he gets this sense behind him that there's somebody following him. And he turns around and he sees his little boy just following him, taking these big steps, trying to stay within his tracks, right? Taking these big steps. He says, what are you doing, son? He said, dad, I just wanted to walk in your footsteps. And he, and he said, you know what? God spoke to his heart and said, wow, do our kids watch us or what? Because they will walk in our footsteps. Here's at the end of, what he's saying here at the end of this psalm is, Lord, I, I want to walk in your footsteps. I, I, want, I want you to be, you know, your footsteps to be my pathway. 
that's the way I want to walk. And what a beautiful thing to say, Lord, I just want to walk the way you would walk, following the Lord. Psalm 86, a prayer of David. Bow down your ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I'm poor and needy. Again, we see we said we were done with the Psalms of David. Remember I told you we weren't totally done. That was the main body of the Psalms of David. Now we see some other uh, Psalms of David kind of mingled in here throughout the rest. Here's one of them. Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I'm poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I'm holy. You are my God. He's not bragging about being holy. He just means he has his heart right with God. He says, you are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry out to you all day long. Oh, I love this line. Rejoice the soul of your servant. Get what he's saying there. He's not saying my soul rejoices. He's saying, I want you to make my soul rejoice. What a great prayer. We need to pray that tonight. I'll try to remember at the end by the time we're there, if I can remember that. Lord, rejoice our soul. Make us rejoice. Don't just give us an option. I love that whole picture with the blessings. It says that blessed are you in the field. He talks about in the Old Testament, God said, if you obey me, you'll be blessed when you go out, blessed when you come in, blessed in the field. He goes, all these blessings. And the picture that it gives in the Hebrew is the blessing chasing you down and tackling you. And the guy's like, oh, here he comes again. Oh, blah, blah. Can't get away. The blessing got me. Oh, man, that's a fast blessing. Oh, I said, three, 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 four, four. <laughs> every time, every time. That's what he says. I will chase you down and bless you. That's the idea behind this line. Rejoice the heart of your soul. Make me rejoice. Don't just let me sit here and be dull. Wake me up spiritually. Bring my life alive. Bring my brain alive to, your, to the senses of the things of the spirit. Make me rejoice. And then, then it just flows out. True worship and rejoicing anyway is a response to God. And he's saying, Lord, do it in me. For to you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. Note that. He desires to forgive us, but oftentimes we hold back because we don't ask for it. We continue on in our sin. He's saying, look, I'm ready. I'm just standing here like, okay, whenever you ask, I'm ready to bless you and restore you. Not yet, not yet. Okay, but whenever you're ready, not yet, not yet. He's just standing there, I'm ready. It's not that God didn't want to forgive. He desires to. And abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I'll call upon you for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall worship, rather shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name for you are great and do wondrous things. You are, or rather you alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord. I don't want to know my way anymore. anymore. I don't want to know anybody else's way. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I pray this prayer. I've prayed this prayer often over the years. God, unite my heart. What does that mean? I've got, sometimes I find that I have a divided heart. Part of it wants to follow God and part of it wants to follow the world. And it's like, so what's going on here? What's the deal? God, unite it. Get the part of my heart that wants to follow the world and bring it in and let it lock in with you. Now, again, there are some practical things you can do if you have a divided heart tonight. One of these is, look, the Bible says we're born with a sin nature. When you give your life to the Lord, you're born again. Now you have two natures, the old nature and the born again. That's why the battle goes on. Why do you think we still struggle to do things we know are wrong? Because the old nature is still alive. We just added a new born again nature to it and now we're forgiven. And it won't be till heaven till the old nature is completely dead. But here's a simple, simple way to conquer the old flesh nature. The one you feed the most is the one that's gonna rule. It's gonna dominate. If you're struggling uh, issues of, of, of the eyes or whatever and you're watching TV all the time, you're watching shows you shouldn't watch, movies you shouldn't watch, for guys, that can be in the physical realm, temptation for men in that area, through the eyes. For women, maybe there's romance in the mind and the husband's not really romantic anymore and these wonderful novels draw you in or maybe you're single and you read the novels and you want that guy to you know, sweep you off your feet. Again, nothing wrong in some guy sweeping you off your feet, so to speak. That's not the point. But what you're feeding is what's gonna to start to dominate. And whatever you're looking at right now, saying, I just wish that I didn't do that all the time. I wish I could stop. Let me ask you, is there an avenue to that in your life? Because there is. There's an avenue. There's some, there's some pipeline that's letting that come right in. You know, somebody come to you one time and said, I'm struggling in this area. And I said, well, do you have any openings to that area? Well, not that I know of. Well, tell me about your life. Well, 
Well, yeah, okay, actually, yeah, I do this, I watch that, I read this, I say, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. You're never gonna be free. You're never gonna conquer because what you're doing is you're feeding it. You, you plugged in a big pipe going, it's a whoa, and your flesh will just take that in. You gotta shut that valve off. You gotta reach out and say, wait a minute, I got a valve of the spirit coming in. I got the valve of the world. You gotta shut the world's valve off and you gotta spend more time in the word, more time in prayer, more time among God's people. And you're gonna find if you do that, all of a sudden your spirit's gonna begin to get super strong and you're, you're still gonna have the old nature. You'll still be tempted from time to time, but it will dominate the old nature and you can live in freedom. You can walk with Christ. How come some believers can do it and some don't? They don't learn the principle of shutting off the valves from the world and keeping the valve open and even increasing it from the Lord. That might be a block on your computer. It might be friends you have to end friendships with. It might be shows you have to quit watching. But I love that show. Well, if you love it more than the Lord, go for it. Enjoy. But you're going to reap the consequences of that. And it won't be good in the end, I promise you. Because God will, again, whatever we pour in, it's, it's not just what we see. You know, interesting, the Lord said to his disciples, he said, be careful what you hear. I've always thought that was interesting, especially for the believer. When you're listening to teachings and certain people and all that, be careful what you hear. Make sure that you know they're solid in scripture because it has more effect than you know. It's like planting seeds in the, in the garden. You know, it's interesting, you put your mulch out, this is the time of year everybody's putting their mulch out. You ever put your mulch out like a tomato starts growing around the middle of the garden? Or something, not usually a tomato, I'm gonna do But these like, that's green beans. Why are green beans growing right here in my flower bed? Because somewhere at the home, you know, at the Home Depot, at the, at the co-op, Somebody allowed a little bit of seed to get mixed in with, with your mulch. And now you put it in there, and it's like, you didn't plant that. They kind of put it in there. You just threw the mulch down, and up comes this stuff you don't want. That's exactly what happens when we allow the world to put stuff in. If we, if we allow it in, it's going to grow. Okay, it's going to take root. It just is. So what are you feeding yourself? What are you planting? Don't be surprised when it's harvest time. If your harvest is the world and sin... You planted it. If your harvest is righteousness and peace, you've planted it. Here's the good news. If your garden is terrible tonight, you can change it all right now. Plow it up, ask God's forgiveness, and say, you know what? I'm planting good seed. Here it goes. I'm getting up tomorrow morning. I'll start reading the word. I'll start praying. I'm gonna quit watching that. I'm gonna quit doing that. I'm gonna talk about legalism. You're free to watch things. I'm talking about things that you know will harm you and you're planting bad into your life, you're gonna reap the benefit of that, and it's not good. And so, again, shutting that off so that you have uh, the, right, the right mix and, and dominating in the things of the Lord as to what God wants to do, and your heart will be united in the Lord, things of the Lord. Verse 12, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. Notice not part of it, all of it. I'm giving it all to you, and I will glorify your name forevermore, for great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Again, that's the pit, uh, as we talked about, in the center of the earth, uh, or eventually in long term would be hell. Oh God, the proud have risen against me and a mob of violent men have sought my life and have not set you before them, but you, O oh Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy. You ever heard somebody say that the Old Testament God's mean and the New Testament God's nice? They're the same God. Here's the Old Testament God. Let's listen to what his attributes are. Here's Old Testament. Compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. There's your God. Oh, turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed. You know, back me up, Lord. I'm, I'm honoring you. Back me up, he's saying, because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. So Psalm 86, Psalm 87 is very short. That's as far as we'll get tonight because Psalm 88 is a little bit of a downer Psalm and we'll explain that more when we get there next week. I wanna end on an up note tonight um, and we'll explain why that is next week. But notice Psalm 87, a Psalm of the sons of Korah, a song. His foundation is in the holy mountains. I believe the foundation of the world is Jerusalem. I think there are many scriptures that indicate that. I think this is another hint. I believe God has actual rock foundations built into the earth in his structure. And I think that part of that foundation is Jerusalem. I think that's what he's talking about here. I could be wrong on that. I'm just saying he talks about his foundations in more than one place, being there at Jerusalem or the holy mountains. And we talked about the fact that when the Lord comes back, 
Jerusalem's going to be pushed up, remember? Oh, ye gates, rise up. Jerusalem raised up like a mountain. I think those foundations are going to just come on right up like a stage rising up, and there's going to be the Lord's platform. He says his foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. It's like, I love Israel. I love the land of Israel, God's saying, but I love Jerusalem best of all. I'll tell you, I'll never forget the first time I saw Jerusalem. It's just like, I could just feel God's favor. Even the clouds looked like they were just flying over going, this is great. <laughs> Seriously, I felt like they were. I was going, you guys are enjoying that, aren't you? Just, you know, and they were kind of moving kind of quick. And I said, it is great. And we're all glad to be here, right? It, there's just something about Jerusalem. It is, and listen, the glory of Jerusalem is going to be amazing when God comes back. But it's even amazing now. There's something special about it. Look, God's eyes are everywhere all the time, right? But he makes a point to say in his word that his eyes never leave Jerusalem. Now, why would God say that? That means he really looks at Jerusalem. So when you're in Jerusalem, you're really being watched. <laughs> I mean, God sees everything anyway. But when you're in Jerusalem and you really want God's attention, he's like, he said, my eyes are there like double. So that's a great place to say, Lord, let's, let's talk. You know, let's get some issues worked out. I don't, you know, I don't get much into the mysticalness of the Western wall as, as it being something that makes things connect better to heaven. But the principle of praying in Jerusalem, I think there is something there. Um, you know, they jokingly over there, they say, you know, you can just, you know, when you go to pray here and all, it's, it's, it's a local call. Uh, so, you know, God's right here. You don't have to, you know, put any extra change in. But again, he says, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Selah. Meditate on that. Oh, yes, they are. Glorious things. The glorious future of Jerusalem rising up, being the desire of all the earth. The throne of Jesus Christ will be there. It'll be an amazing, beautiful city. So he says, glorious things are, are planned for you. When I go there, I say, what's it going to be like? I love the term, the city of the great king. I love thinking about it. It's called the city of the great king. And of course, you look at it now and go, man, it's like, it's not quite the city of the great king yet. It's going to be the city of the great king. It's going to be amazing. Again, horses running through the streets with bells on them with this like, holiness to the Lord and all the glory and all the things and the pomp and the circumstance. It's going to be amazing. And so he's basically foreseeing that and saying, oh, glorious things are spoken of you. Selah, meditate on, on this, you city of God. And now he talks briefly here in the last few verses about the thousand year reign. He says, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Rahab is another term for Egypt. Babylon, self-explanatory. Notice he says, I'll make mention of them. In other words, there's going to be some believers coming out of Egypt and Babylon. I'll make mention of them. There, there's, I've got my believers there as well. And again, he's talking about during the millennial kingdom, they'll be there. He says, behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. So in Egypt, I have believers there too. This one was born there. So there's going to be a registry, it would appear, of where people are born during the thousand year reign. And he said, I'll be keeping a track of those that were born in, in Egypt and in Babylon and, and, the, and the area of Philistia, which uh, the Gaza area and all that. And Tyre, which is the modern Lebanon, Lebanon, uh, Lebanon region. Ethiopia, which is again in, in Africa. He says, this one was born there. And to Zion, it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. So can you imagine uh, during the millennial kingdom, where were you born? I was from Ethiopia. Where were you? I was born in you know, Egypt. Oh, really? Where were you? Jerusalem. Oh, wow. You were born in Jerusalem. That's cool. And so apparently God's going to keep up with that stuff. He says, out of Zion, it will be said. People will be saying this. This one was born in her. And the most high himself shall establish her. The Lord will record. So he's going to keep some kind of record of where those that are being born during the millennial kingdom will be born. Notice when he, that is the Lord, registers the peoples. So God's going to keep up with his people. He's going to know his people. He's going to know. And he says, he's going to say, this one was born there. So Selah. So there'll be again, just genealogical records of where people are born, where they're from, how the Lord's going to use all that. I don't know. But again, we know it's going to be amazing. He says, both the singers and the players on instruments say, and so now the choir comes in, everybody's singing, all my springs are in you. That is all my refreshment, all my life. Everything that's gonna give me life and revive me, Lord, is found in you. And what a great way to end this psalm. That we would pray that God would have all of his springs would just be in us, that God would rejoice our hearts tonight. Wouldn't that be great? So just to ask him, Lord, let your springs well up in us. Rejoice our hearts. Make us rejoice. You know, don't let it be an option. You know, chase us down with your blessings. Tackle us in the rows here at Calvary Chapel. 
with your goodness so that we might give you glory. Lord, revive us. If you need restoring tonight, let's pray for restoration. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray for rejoicing of heart. And let's pray for the springs of God in our life and in our heart. Great Psalms tonight. We'll take up an 88 next week. And uh, that'll be good to start with that one. So we have some good ones following it to kind of make up for uh, the heaviness of it, which we'll talk about when we get there next week. But either way, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word tonight. What beautiful Psalms, what great Psalms. And Lord, that is our prayer. Everything you said tonight, God, that's our prayer before you tonight. I thank you that you planted the seeds in our heart. But Lord, I pray that you would rejoice our hearts tonight. God, for those in here that maybe have repented but need revival, that you'd revive them. For those in here tonight that maybe haven't repented, that they would repent. God, for those in here that don't feel any rejoicing and haven't felt rejoicing in a long time, Lord, I, I don't pray that you'd help them work up rejoicing. I pray that you would rejoice their heart. Right now from heaven, pour out your spirit on us, Lord. Rejoice our hearts, fill us with you. And let it just be spontaneous praise and thankfulness because we can't help it. Lord, let the blessings chase us down and overtake us. And Lord, we say with the psalmist tonight, all of our springs are in you. But there's no other refreshment that lasts. There's no other life that's real. It's all in you. It's the springs of heaven. So all of our springs, Lord, all of our refreshment, all of our hope, our joy, our life, everything's in you. Lord, fill us. Rejoice over your people even now as we rejoice about our great God and give you praise and glory. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, that it truly is better to be one day in the courts of the Lord than a thousand anywhere else because it's where you are. And Lord, even the birds, even they want to be here because they love you and they rejoice over you as well. So we thank you, Lord, and we give you glory for the work of your spirit tonight among your people. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's rejoice in the Lord. Let's worship. God bless you guys.